Okay, welcome to Robotics 2. In today's class, we are going to talk about autopilot design. Basically, we will be talking about how do we make the, the aerial vehicle fly autonomously and follow a certain path. This chapter is heavily dependent on chapter five. So I will tell you uh, the physical understanding uh, of these different loops. And then we will talk about interpretation and then we will get into mathematics. Now, one thing I just want to clarify that I'm gonna go very slow in this chapter because uh, as you will notice, the things become convoluted because one parameter depends on other parameter, one control affects the other control. So I'm gonna go very slowly and I would encourage you to review the textbook and make sure that you understand the, the process because when we do the project, some of these concepts will be needed. So first and foremost, whenever we say autopilot, what comes to our mind? So, so basically, when we talk about autonomy, there are different levels of autonomy. And a very simple level of autonomy is the aircraft can stabilize itself. Now, what do I mean by stabilization? Which means the aircraft if there is some wind disturbance and aircraft is rolled on its own somehow with some control algorithm, the aircraft goes back to its level flight. The second example is if you have an aircraft, which is the level flight or climbing and all of a sudden the wind velocity or the air velocity increases, because of increase in the air velocity, the lift increases. And because of the lift, the aircraft, which initially was height H1, will now start flying at height H2. So what needs to happen in that case, the autopilot needs to change the pitch angle to reduce the angle of attack, to effectively reduce the, the angle of, uh, reduce effectively the amount of lift force and then the aircraft can come down. Now recognize this process is something like this. The airspeed increases, aircraft goes up, then autopilot reduces the angle of attack, aircraft goes down. Again, autopilot increases angle of attack by changing the, the elevator and then gradually somehow you oscillate up and down about the desired height, or this is also called as the set point. So this is a basic stabilization. For the other stabilization is in the yaw. Say for an example, if you have yaw disturbance and the aircraft, which was flying straight and level, now kind of tilts left or right. Then autopilot makes certain changes in the rudder. So aircraft comes back to its original position. Now, some of you may ask me, if we are, if our aircraft is stable, asymptotically stable to begin with, do we need stabilization or active stabilization? And the answer to that question is yes, because when we design an aircraft, we make certain assumptions. These assumptions may be violated as the aircraft flies, the mass could change, the CG could shift. When CG shifts, the moment of inertia is alter. Uh, we change the battery, we change the location of the battery uh, or the motor or prop they wear and tear and then basically the efficiency drops down. So the initial control algorithm 
that we are we have designed or initial stability analysis that we have performed may may be not valid when the actual flight occurs also the external disturbance even though we try to compensate for it we can't actually predict it so there are these uncertainties so basically you have something called as the stabilization loop and this is the innermost loop you want your aircraft to be stable the next thing is you want your aircraft to follow certain path so you want your aircraft to go from point a to point b so you want aircraft to go from certain point and as soon as you have path you have something called as the course angle and which is chi and then you will notice that you will have uh, angle gamma so you need some sort of control on these two parameters then the next thing you would ask is just like the robot as the aircraft is going from point a to point b it needs to go from these different different small points so 1 2 3 these are the intermediate points that the aircraft needs to go to so which means you need some sort of interpolation that will take aircraft from point a to 1 from 1 to 2 2 to 3 and 3 to b sometimes you you want to have a formation flight which means you have two or more aircraft they fly in sync so this as you increase the level of autonomy and as you try to make your aircraft smarter the complexity increases so if you look at an architecture this is the broad architecture that typically is followed so what you have is you have the unmanned vehicle which is nothing but your aircraft and in the context of this course we are looking at a fixed wing aircraft so uh, we are not looking at rotor craft or quad rotors or helicopters or tilt rotors or stop rotors uh then what we have is with this unmanned vehicle you have external wind disturbance now clearly we need to understand what is the current state of the aircraft in other words we need to know what is the current value of roll uh, pitch roll and yaw rate we need to know what is the uh, attitude so roll pitch and yaw we need to know where the aircraft is which means in the north east down we need to know the locations and other parameters like angle of attack and so on that could be or and air speed that could be measured with external sensor and this is not a trivial task so state estimation will be studied in very much detail in chapter 8 most likely the sensors that we are going to use are going to be noisy for an example if i were to use an accelerometer or if i were to use a gyroscope or if i were to use a magnetometer not going to give me super accurate reading as a matter of fact as i travel from point a to point b the magnetic field will change that will affect the performance of the magnetometer again the gps may be available or may not be available at certain locations so what it means is this system is super duper complex so and then again the measurements that come out of the sensors could have some uh, flicker noise some electronic noise quantization noise so we will talk about some sort of filtering filtering and estimation so the idea is how do we get the best possible result when we have input that is corrupt and when we have external disturbances that are affecting the input and the sensors 
that measuring input themselves have uh, incorrect information. So all that will be talked in detail in chapter eight. But consider that we do that, we perform filtering and estimation and get clean uh, sensing. Say for an example, we have this information that is super clean, but then how do we tweak the autopilot so that the unmanned vehicle is stable in lateral direction and in longitudinal direction? So this is the basic inner loop. So, and this inner loop that needs to be uh, satisfied or that needs to be worked out before we go further. Because if the aircraft is not stabilized point, it can't go from uh, point A to point B and follow certain path. So once aircraft is stable, then what we do is we have something called as the path following. So which means we want this aircraft to follow this certain path. And this certain path is not a sort of a continuous path, but we have discrete points and we want aircraft to go from point A to point B via these intermediate points. And then when it traveling, again, the aircraft is not gonna be accurately following this path. So there is going to be some type of tracking error, which means you want your path to be like this, but you will notice your aircraft is going to take path like this. So you need to find out what is the tracking error and then somehow come up with algorithms to compensate for tracking error so that the aircraft follows the approximate path that is specified. Then again, when we talk about the path following, these airspeed, altitude, heading, all of the hands, they need to be issued to the lower level controller. So we go to certain point at certain altitude, maintaining certain heading at certain airspeed. Now, once we have path, we need to come up with some sort of a path manager. It, this is exactly similar to the trajectory generation that we talked about in, uh, in Robotics 1. So if you remember in Robotics 1, so we talked about trajectory planning and smoothening. So how do we have a, a robot arm go from point A to point B following certain velocity acceleration constraints. So when we have a path manager, the basic purpose is this path manager is going to take into account the error in the position, error in the tracking, and then that path manager algorithm is going to manage the path. And please notice that these are broad architectures, but what they are, they are nothing but mathematical algorithms that are implemented on an embedded system. So first and foremost, is we come up with the model, then we actually implement uh, the, uh, the algorithms, we tune their performance, and finally, we actually burn those algorithms. We write a C code and flash an embedded system or a computer, a CPU, and then that system actually flies the plane. So if you think about it, this is a very complex system wherein you have an autopilot. And if you have some experience with uh, pickhawks, so, uh, this is a very famous autopilot. So think about it, it's like an autopilot. That has some onboard sensing. So there are some sensors, like you will have a, a barometer. You would have an accelerometer. You will have a gyroscope. And then you will have maybe a microcontroller, 
and then you will notice there will be servos and these servos will be connected to your aileron so these will be the servos and i don't know if you have seen a servo motor so this will be for aileron then this servo could be for elevator this servo could be for the rudder and then you will have some input for your motor that is going to give you uh, the thrust and then the idea is these servos so s1 s2 s3 will control the control surfaces so control surfaces so your elevator your rudder and your aileron are controlled by these servos this motor is going to control the thrust now autopilot sometimes may have additional inputs so you can actually provide uh, some additional sensors and you can interface this with maybe some sort of a camera so you have vision or you can include you could have a gps interface and basically this autopilot needs to be powered so you are going to have a small battery that will just power the autopilot the battery for the motor and servo could be separate because they will require lot of power so one battery can power the autopilot another battery can power the the motor and the servos sometimes instead of one microcontroller you could have two microcontrollers and they split the task of controlling different servos sometimes the inner loop is run on the microcontroller at very high frequency say 96 megahertz and the outer loop is run on the microcontroller that has maybe 48 megahertz so you can have the guidance system you can have the vision system you can have the stabilizer so all these on an aircraft if you consider the aircraft one thing you have to be very careful that this autopilot is also going to add weight to the aircraft so when you integrate that into the airframe you have to make sure the autopilot along with battery controls it's at proper location so that it does not make the aircraft unstable and it's actually a good idea if you can go to the website pickhawk and then look at the way the autopilot is set up sometimes autopilot could have telemetry so it could have an antenna and you would have a ground station wherein you have something called as uh, display and a software so this autopilot can transmit connect via wireless usually it's an rf link in the case of uh, pickhawk that is called as mauling mauling is a special uh, a format a protocol wherein the autopilot communicates with the ground station and then what you can do is you can interface that with some sort of google map or you can interface with some sort of uh, uh, a picture viewer and then you can actually track how the aircraft is going from point a to point b and you can also use this to track the camera nowadays uh, the smartphones have lot of computational power so maybe in some cases the computers are replaced with stand alone uh, smartphones so you can have an iphone or you can have an android phone and you would be able to communicate uh, with the drone so this is the overall structure of the autopilot and designing an autopilot is not a trivial task 
but what we are going to do is we are going to follow a very simple approach and to be honest with you uh, you wouldn't be expected to design the autopilot from ground up what you would be expected to do as a roboticist is to use a commercially available autopilot program your algorithms and codes and make sure that the system is behaving the way you intended so that will be the primary purpose of uh, implementing an autonomy or autonomous flight capability into a, a uav now let's talk about what we are going to study in this chapter this chapter is probably one of the the biggest chapter and very important so this chapter if you look at the textbook it talks about the successive loop closure so this is the section that is discussed in the book quite well and we will study successive loop closure and then we will briefly touch upon total energy control and the lqr control so we will study successive loop closure in in detail and again once again i need to emphasize that you cannot study this chapter in isolation you will have to go kind of back and forth between this chapter which is chapter 6 and chapter 5 just to to close the the loop so to speak and to connect the dots because here is what we have studied in the last chapter we came up with a transfer function or a state space model for a lateral control or or a lateral uh, dynamics we came up with a transfer function or a state space model for longitudinal dynamics and i'm just going to show it as a block diagram so for an example we have a gs1 this is the transfer function for lateral dynamics we have gs2 which is the transfer function for longitudinal dynamics and clearly you would have some external disturbances you will have some parameters so for a mo moment just think about that that everything that block diagram is reduced to one big block and that is shown over here so this block indicates lateral dynamics and when i say lateral dynamics it is basically roll and yaw and there is a longitudinal dynamics which contains pitch angle of attack and other variables now what we did in chapter 5 is from those 13 equations that those were indicated on the genesis block or the very first slide in chapter 5 we reduced all those to some simple linear approximate equations and i mean we agree that those linear equations were accurate in a very limited range but if you look at the whole nonlinear regime of behavior and you sort of partition this into small small linear parts then we can potentially use these linearized model to control in this region so there is a linearization model in this region so l1 you have another linearization l2 you have another l linear linearization l3 and so on so clearly the blocks here are going to be different so transfer functions are going to be different but we will with this linearization approach we will be able to come up with a very simple controller that will maintain the desired stability in that teeny tiny region if we go beyond that region clearly we will use a different model and different controller gain and this is very widely used and this is called as gain scheduling so what you have is you have multiple linear models 
that are approximating this nonlinear system. So you have this nonlinear model. And then after linearization, you have a linear first model, you have the second linear model and the third linear model. And based on certain scheduling parameter, say I'm gonna call that scheduling parameter is some combination of roll pitch and yaw. So there is some scheduling parameter and I'm gonna call that epsilon. That scheduling parameter depends upon some function of roll pitch and yaw. So if the scheduling is parameters are within region for epsilon one, you would use the linear model one. If the scheduling parameter is really close to epsilon two, you would use the linear model two. If the scheduling parameter is related to epsilon three or close to epsilon three, you would use the linear model three. Clearly for each linear model, you will have a different controller scheme. And maybe you can use the same type of controller. You can use a proportional controller, but the gains for the proportional controller would be different. So here is the basic idea. We are going to look at the models that we developed in last class. First, we will look at whether these models are stable or unstable, and then add a controller to it. And then what we will do is, we will have a feedback loop. It could be a unity feedback or it could be some sort of a, feed, uh, a transfer function. But what will happen is you will have a compensator or controller over here that will maintain the desired stability what we want. And what's gonna happen is if you think about complicated system, you are gonna have, since we talked about autonomy at stabilization level, autonomy at the, the path level, you are gonna have this cascaded transfer function. So you are gonna have the, so G1, you will have G1 bar, you will have G1 double bar. So all these cascaded transfer function, so what we will do is we will start with the innermost loop, add a controller block and stabilize this. Once this is stabilized, what we will do is we will go to the next loop, add a controller block, stabilize this. And this process will continue till all the loops are stabilized. And ideally, if you think about this process of stabilization, mathematically, it is actually very simple. You have a transfer function and that transfer function has poles in certain region. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that your poles at a particular location so that the gain margin and the phase margin requirements are satisfied. In other words, what you will do is, so just to give an example, this is the imaginary axis. This is the real axis. And let's assume to begin with, the poles are over here. Poles are the frequencies, which means the system is unstable to begin with. With the controller, I'm gonna shift these poles to a particular desired location so that my performance specifications like rise time, dwell time, or if I have frequency domain specifications like bandwidth, they are satisfied. So that is what we are going to do in successive loop closures. Once again, we want to make sure that the innermost loop is fast or the fastest. Then the loop outer that is faster and then the loop, which is the outermost, is sort of fast. Now that is indicated by the bandwidth. So for an example, you want your actuators in the innermost loop to respond very quickly. When we have high bandwidth, in other words, you can say that the actuators are, are exposed
uh, responding very quickly or sensors are processing data very quickly, then as we go out, outer, 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 then you can afford to have slow uh, actuators or uh, the sensor data being processed at a slightly lower speed. One thing that we have to be careful about is something called as the saturation. Now, if you look at the servo, so what is this concept of saturation? So if you look at a simple servo, okay, I'm just gonna show you a schematic diagram for servo. Servo will have an arm. And if you think inside, there will be a small motor, there will be a potentiometer, and usually it is driven by PWM. So this servo can go from max to min. So it has certain range, max to min. And that means if this servo is attached to a control surface, if this servo is attached to a control surface, then clearly this control surface have a max deflection, theta max, and it will have a theta min. So when we talk about saturation, which means that you want your system or you want your servo to be operating in this region. We don't want it to go to theta max. We don't want it to go to theta min. And clearly we don't want our servo command to go outside theta max or theta min. So that is a very common problem when we design the practical systems because practical systems, they have uh, limitations on the hardware. They have limitations on speed. They have limitations on power consumptions. All these different, different considerations need to be weighed and balanced before we actually implement a real-time uh, controller or real-time autopilot. Now, first let me discuss how this successive loop closure is carried out. And then gradually we will take the example for the lateral dynamics. And then we will take an example for the linear dynamics and apply this loop closure technique. Once again, you will notice that there will be a lot of equations. And these equations may seem confusing, but in essentially they are not. I will try to give you some physical interpretation and then we will try to solve the problems. So let's quickly recap what is this successive loop closure. Say so here is what we did in chapter uh, five that we linearized, we did all those tricks and we found out that our model is nothing but a cascaded transfer function. So we supply input u to the first transfer function. I'm going to call this tf1. This transfer function, and please note, these are all open loop. This transfer function takes this input u, converts that to output y. So you have this input. And this input could be anything. This could be the aileron command. This could be the elevator command, this could be any other command or total command. It takes this transfer function, converts that into output. So this is the output of the first transfer function. This output becomes the input of the next transfer function. So you have this input. Still, everything is in the open loop. There is no closed loop. So output of any transfer function is not fed back. Now input U2 gets converted to output Y2. And this output becomes the input for the last transfer function. And at the end, you get output. And one thing that you might want to think about is these intermediate outputs can be um, some, so for an example, you have input like throttle. And that gives you an output, and I'm just, for the sake of discussion, on say, rudder deflection or aileron deflection. 
that output is straight to the next transfer function, it gives you something else. So the idea is how do we close these loops? In a systematic fashion that this overall system is controlled. And there is a simple trick that is used. And this simple trick is you start with the innermost transfer function. So you start with the innermost transfer function. And please note this innermost transfer function is something called as P1. And you add a controller or compensator. And these terms are used interchangeably, uh, but there is a subtle difference. So controller is sort of, uh, it's controlling the dynamics, compensator can be used to compensate or cancel out certain part of dynamics. So you add a control or a compensator block C1. And what you do is you tap the output of the transfer function and feed it to the summing junction. And so if you feed this output, what you have here is nothing but the error. And this error gets fed to the controller and this controller algorithm essentially changes the, the applied input on the plant. So this error, when you multiply that with the compensator transfer function, gives you an input U1. And please note, this U1 is different. This is different than U that was acting in our earlier case. So U is different. So now what you have is U1, that U1 acts on the transfer function P1, and now you have an output Y1. This Y1 output gets fed as an input to the transfer function two. And now what we do is we again uh, take the feedback and then have it at summing junction and then have another compensator or controller that would control this entire inner loop. So now think about it is like now we have this block. When we took care of the innermost uh, P1, now when we go to P2, this is the block that we are dealing with. And this controller is going to control this block. But the good news is the innermost block, which is P1, C1 is already controlled so now we have to control the dynamics of P2. Once that dynamics is controlled, you can go a step farther and then add C3 and control P3. And hope is once we continue with this process, your entire open loop system is now controlled in the closed loop. Once again, this arrangement or this algorithm works as long as the bandwidth conditions are satisfied, which means the innermost loop is running at higher bandwidth than the outermost loop. Now let's go uh, with this interesting approach. Now, there are multiple ways of doing this, but most generally what we do is we try to cancel out or the dynamics in such a way that what we have is we have unity gain. Now let me explain what this means. So let's start what where we were. Initially, we had a, a transfer function P1 of S. And then what we did, we wanted to control this with some sort of a controller. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a controller. So CS and then add a summing junction. And then I'm gonna add a unity feedback. 
which means there is no transfer function uh, for the feedback. Feedback is just unity. So schematically, this is minus plus, and now we have, so what I want to do is, I would like to find out the closed loop, closed loop transfer function. A quick sidebar. If you remember, we talked about the closed loop transfer function. So in robotics one is if you have something like this, you have GS, you have GS, and this is a sidebar, but it just do this. So output divided by input for the closed loop, if you recollect, is GS divided by one plus GS times HS. Now, in this particular case, the case that we are discussing, HS is equal to one because it's unity feedback. The next thing which I wanna talk about is uh, if you think about the controller in series, controller in series with the plant. So this is G of S. I'm gonna call this C of S. Using the block diagram reduction, we can replace these both like C of S times G of S. So what we have is we have the, the transfer function that is the product of C of S and G of S. Now, once we add a controller, what happens is the closed loop, remember here H of S is one. So the closed loop transfer function for this is C of S, G of S divided by one plus C of S, G of S. This is called as the closed loop transfer function. And this is an interesting equation. And we will, we will encounter this equation again and again, again and again in this chapter. And I want you to think about this a little bit carefully. So what this equation is telling us. Right now, think about C of S, it's sort of an unknown. So when I say unknown, we know the form, but we don't know the exact value. So what it means is if I were to use uh, just a P controller, C of S is just a constant, KP. If I use a PI PD controller, this is for just proportional controller. If I were to use C of S as a proportional plus uh, integrated or, or, or let's start with that, a proportional derivative. So S KD, so this is proportional plus derivative. And if I were to add C of S as proportional plus derivative plus integrative ki. Okay, so this is the controller that we are going to have. So what it means is the form of the controller is known, but the values of kp, ki, and k they are not known. So essentially this closed loop transfer function, and let me explain this uh, in a new slide because this is actually a very fundamental concept. So, so consider we have a trans function and our objective is that this transfer function will be some sort of, we, our hope is some sort of second order transfer function. So S square plus some S plus some constant for the sake of discussion, I'm calling 10. So this is some sort of, some terms, uh, so S plus one. 
So you have this transfer function. And then what we are doing is we are appending or we are adding a controller. For the sake of discussion, let me say we are adding a, a proportional controller. And now what I want to do is I want to add a feedback loop. I want to add a feedback loop and somehow try to control this. Somehow try to control this. We spent some time in robotics one talking about different uh, types of loops, proportional, integral, derivative. But I just want to talk about physical interpretation for a second. So what this is going to do is this is actually going to change my overall transfer function as something like kp s plus one divided by s square plus s plus 10. So now I have got this transfer function. Now, how do I find out the closed loop transfer function? We know closed loop transfer function from the equation is something like kp s plus one divided by s square plus s plus 10. And now I want you to carefully observe what happens in the denominator. This is one plus kp s plus one divided by s square plus s plus 10. Now, as you can see, some simplification is certainly possible. So closed loop transfer function, if I were to simplify, this is gonna be kp s plus one divided by s plus s plus 10 kp s plus one. And you can see s square, uh, this term gets canceled. So now I have this closed loop transfer function kp s plus one divided by s square. And please note, I have a few interesting terms here that can be combined. So I can combine one plus kp, one plus kp s plus, I would have 10 plus kp. So what happened is just by a proportional controller. And to be honest with you, what is this proportional controller? This proportional controller is nothing but a game. What it is doing is taking that error and somehow amplifying it. Now, obviously the, the quick question here is, how do you realize this system physic and physically? So mathematical condition for physical realization is the order of the numerator should be less than or equal to order of the denominator, which means as you can see, the order of the numerator here is one order of the denominator is two. So this system is physically realizable, which means you can physically build it. It can be, can be studied physically. Now, if you want to implement this on an actual aircraft, what does it mean? So think about it. In the last class, we looked at coming up with transfer functions. So now just imagine that my transfer function is something like, uh, I'm gonna call elevator gain delta E. So delta E is my input, delta E is coming out here. And what I'm tapping here is nothing but the pitch angle, so theta P. And how is this pitch angle measured? Pitch angle is measured by means of accelerometers and gyroscopes. So I have a sensor on the physical aircraft. So I have this aircraft, And on this aircraft, what I have is I have elevators in the back. I have elevators in the back. They are controlling delta E, but I also have some sort of IMU or sensor, accelerometer and gyroscope that is giving me measurement of the orientation. And in this ca case, pitch. So I have this theta P that theta p somehow 
is fed back that theta p is somehow fed back and somehow mapped on to the elevator command and now you may ask me that uh, how is this mapping done and this mapping is basically achieved using the servo so think about the physical realization that you have the servo this servo is actually uh, controlling the theta min or theta max and there is a relationship between the deflection of the control surface if it is an elevator and the pitch angle so you have some sort of mapping and this mapping is not clear here but that mapping can be realized by means of one another block or another transfer function another transfer function that takes this input for theta p and converts that into an appropriate elevator command and clearly please try to understand that you cannot add dollars to pesos dollars to dollars pesos to pesos so which means when you are at the summing junction if your variable that is uh, if you, your variable is the deflection of the control surface somehow you need to get this pitch angle come find out that mapping using the servo gain or some sort of uh, uh, numerical algorithm or some sort of lookup table and convert that theta pitch to appropriate uh, elevator deflection so now here is the trick what i want to do is at the end of the day all said and done i want this closed loop transfer function to be equal to 1 and that's all there is to it so what it means is our job is to find kp in such a way that this whole guy becomes one you will some of you may question or some of you may think about it hey how can this be done uh, you can see that you have kp on the top so if this we want this to be one the numerator should be equal to denominator and i agree with you i mean we don't want it to be exact one we want it to be very close or approximate to one so somehow find the value of kp so that the numerical uh, the numerator of this equation is very close to the denominator uh, of this equation for all possible values of s now you may notice that in this particular case it may not be possible what that means is the controller scheme a simple proportional controller that we have used is not going to satisfy what we are trying to do so instead of just a proportional controller let's change it with a proportional and derivative controller so what happens then so now what i have is i have a proportional plus derivative controller and this is the transfer function for the pd controller this is the transfer function for pd controller and i will use that to control my plant and where did this plant come from this plant came from the equations that we derived in chapter 5 open loop transfer functions and let's assume that the transfer function is something like s square plus s plus 10 i again the same drill so what you will do is you will have a a, a a summing junction you will grab the output and then feed that output the summing junction and then again find the closed loop transfer function and you will perform the same block diagram reduction and that will have a numerator and that will have a denominator and the objective is find out the values of kp and kd so the objective here is find kp and kd 
the closed loop transfer function is approximately equal to one. And that is the basic methodology and premise of the successive loop closure. So what we are gonna do is we are gonna use proportional derivative control. Sometimes we will proportional derivative and integral control. So I will add this ki one over s in such a way that the closed loop transfer function becomes one. And when that happens, we will say that yes, we have closed the loop. And again, we don't expect KP, KD, and KI. These are the controller gains. These are the controller gains. At this point, we don't expect KP, KD, and KI to be optimal. But we want to find out some combination. And to be honest with you, there is there may not be a unique combination. So you can, depending upon what uh, parameters you choose, you may get different values of KP, KD, and KI. So, but what we want to do at the end, no matter whatever is the value of KP, KD, KI, that combination should reduce the closed loop transfer function to one. That is all there to it when we are going to successively close the loop. You will only notice that as we go to the dynamics, this transfer function will become complicated. So here I have shown a very simple second order transfer function. But once we study the lateral dynamics, when we study the longitudinal dynamics, these transfer functions are going to become complicated. But the good news is these controllers are not. Your controller transfer function will be something similar. May not be exactly same, but similar. But at the end, when you come up with this closed loop transfer function, and we don't have to do this by hand. MATLAB can help us. Finally, the closed loop transfer function should be equal to one. And that is the meaning or essence of successful loop closure. So what happens is, if you think about it, that the innermost loop got closed to one, the loop next to it with transfer function P2 was converted to a unity gain. And the last part is choose the value of C3, choose the gains or choose the controller in C3. So KP, KI and KD, choose in such a way that this whole loop is equal to one. Once again, I need to clarify, you need to take into account the bandwidth which means whatever inner loop that you are going to choose, that has to be, uh, that must have the highest bandwidth. So P1, and, and this actually means something. So when we talk about bandwidth, what does it mean in terms of bandwidth? Bandwidth, you can think about how fast or slow system behaves or system responds. And depending upon whom you talk to, uh, the definitions of bandwidth kind of change. So for an example, if you're talking to someone who is designing the filters, the bandwidth may be the, the frequency band. So, so lower frequency and higher frequency, this is the band in which some interesting things are happening. So for an example, if you have, uh, a low pass filter, what you are doing is you are passing all the signals uh, lower than frequency one. If you have a high pass filter, maybe you are passing the frequency, the, the signals with very high frequencies. For example, if you have a filter like this, that gets passed. If you have a low pass filter, then what you do is basically a very small uh, frequency component get passed. If you have a band pass filter, then the signals that have frequency between the start frequency and the end frequency get passed. But in the case of autopilot design, we can assume 
the bandwidth definition indicates the actuators and sensors should be able to respond very quickly and the control loop should run fast because at the end of the day all this controller all this mathematics all this algorithm needs to operate on some hardware so you want to make sure that this inner loop is completely if it is inner loop is running at 120 hertz then outer loop by factor of 10 can run at 12 hertz so that ensures that the system that is inside is controlled before the outside system is controlled. So if it's about 12 hertz, which means in one second, there are 12 cycles of computation. And in one second, there are 120 times this computation is done. So you wanna make sure that the actuator that you use the innermost loop is able to flap are able to respond 120 times per second because if it may happen that you send the command but ask that that actuator is so slow that it, it cannot act on that command quickly so by that time it's trying to act on the previous command next command get issued next command get issued that finally that uh, the actuator goes to some position that you really don't want it to be so this is the meaning of the successive loop closure. And now what we will do is we will uh, deep dive into the, the equations and the dynamics. So a quick recap. If you recollect, this slide comes from chapter five. This slide comes from chapter five. And we discussed this in detail. But let me talk about when we are trying to control the role dynamics, what are we exactly trying to do? If you recollect the second order equation for the role, which is phi, and that we did using the finding the first derivative and then adding the controller inputs and all that in chapter five, that is expressed something like this. And in this transfer function, you will notice there is delta A, which is the aileron input. You have some constants, A phi two and A phi one. They are dependent on different parameters and those are constants. And then you have something called as disturbance. And if you look at the overall schematic, so if you look at the, the way the transfer function looks like, this is how the transfer function open loop transfer function loops. This is the open loop transfer function. Now, if you look at the open loop transfer function, we uh, went and actually appended additional equations and made it sort of complete for lateral dynamics. And what we initially, we derived the transfer function for the role dynamics. Then we related that to the course angle, which is chi. And then we got this transfer function. Please note, this, this is the initial role transfer function. And then we added that with the transfer function for heading, I'm sorry, transfer function for the course angle chi and now as you can see, my output is sky, but my input is aileron deflection. So it is something similar to you had the role transfer function and you appended that with the, the course angle transfer function. So now this looks complex. Now what we want to do is we want to systematically design the controller so that the first innermost loop becomes one, then the next loop becomes one. So let's look at how that uh, loop closure is going to look like. But before I talk about the loop closure, are there any questions at this point? So our idea is to come up with a controller to find out the controller gains, KP, KI, KD, so that at the end of the day, the closed loop transfer function becomes close to unity.
and I will demonstrate to you how it is done in the case of this simple lateral transfer function. Again, please understand, essentially there are two transfer fun functions that are cascaded and we are going to step by step uh, uh, use the closure to eliminate the transfer function effects. Any questions at this point? Okay, no questions. So here is how we do it. So now I want you to, for a moment, look at the innermost loop. So if you look at the innermost loop for the roll control, and look at this, this is the roll dynamics. So I'm gonna design the controller so that the innermost roll dynamics is compensated or the closed loop transfer function for the loop dynam uh, roll dynamics is equal to one. And the way it is done is this is the roll dynamics equation. What you have is here, you have the aileron. Here, you have the roll rate. This roll rates get integrated and you have the roll angle that is coming out. And now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to capture or somehow measure the roll angle, feed that roll angle all the way over here to the summing junction and the difference between what's coming in and the, the output roll angle is the error. That error gets fed to a proportional controller. Now, some of you may ask me, how do you decide what type of controller you want to choose? And to be honest with you, it's a, a, a long discussion because in, in last uh, uh, year, I mean, last semester, we talked about what proportional controller can do, what derivative controller can do, what are their limitations, what is integral wind up, and then uh, so how do we place poles using different, different controller schemes? So it has to relate to that. So you can actually review the material that we discussed in last class, I mean, a last uh, 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 robotics class, and then see what cases uh, we use the proportional controller, in which cases we use the derivative controller and so on. But one thing that I want to talk about here is I said earlier that somehow we cannot add dollars to pesos. So this, Roll rate is fed into some transfer function, KD phi. This roll rate is fed into some transfer function so that the, at the end of the day, so after output of this transfer function, it's some form of aileron control or deflection of aileron. So you can't just feed the roll rate. Uh, you need to take that roll rate uh, run that through a transfer function. And that transfer function could be a lookup table. That transfer function could be an integrator. That transfer function could be integrator differentiator. It could be anything. It would just have to be a mathematical relationship, either constant or, or changing with time. So it has to be a mathematical relationship that will take this rule rate and convert that into actuator deflection angles. So that is what is being fed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose, somehow I'm gonna choose the value of KP. Choose this so that this whole thing equals to one or approximately equals to one. So that is the fundamental purpose of the lateral direction autopilot. Now this is, this autopilot, mind you, is only controlling rule, however, what we have is outside the rule. So if you look at, this is the rule dynamics. Outside the rule dynamics, we have the course dynamics or we have to somehow control the course angle. So what we need to do is once this innermost loop is closed, once this inner loop, uh, loop is closed, we go a step further and we add a controller on the course angle so that the 
coarse angle loop is closed. So that means this outside loop somehow gets approximated to one. And that is what we are going to study. And then the obvious next question is that there is a roll and yaw coupling. So there is a roll and yaw coupling, which means if you change the roll angle, you change the roll angle, the yaw changes. Or if you change the yaw angle, roll changes. And that is why we are able to control a Zagi plane because of this roll and yaw coupling. Because Zagi plane does not have a rudder. Zagi only has uh, elevons that can be used to control the roll. So there is a relationship between the roll angle and the yaw angle. There is roll to yaw coupling that is utilized in Zagi to turn the aircraft. But in many cases, we do not want that coupling. We want roll to be independently controlled with yaw. So we, whenever we change roll, we don't want yaw to change. In that case, we use something called as the yaw damper. And yaw damper is used when you have a separate rudder. So basically that is control, used to control yaw. So the idea is you take the variation in the roll and feed this through this transfer function in such a way that the, the bad effects of roll on yaw are canceled. Once again, I repeat that. What does this yaw damper do? Yaw damper makes teeny tiny change in the rudder deflection so that the, the yaw that is introduced because of roll is compensated. And we will talk about this particular transfer function um, in detail. But the key observation, key takeaway here is quickly observe that your numerator, the highest order of derivative, the numerator is two. So the numerator is second order and look at the highest order of derivative in the denominator is three. So clearly order of the numerator is less than the order of the denominator, but nevertheless, these are not super complicated differential equations. This is not a super complicated transfer function. It is second order. The numerator has the second order transfer function or second, or second order equation and the denominator has a third order equation that we can very easily manage sometimes by hand or sometimes by MATLAB. Now I want you to think about this command that is being fed that command is passing through this transfer function. Now, this transfer function has a particular form. This is tau r s divided by tau r s plus one. This is actually a filter. Now, this filter is used to, to, uh, to cancel out unwanted part of the signal. So for an example, if you have a signal and that signal has uh, a very quickly varying part. So some part is quickly varying and some part is slowly varying. So you can use appropriate filter to let quickly varying part go. That is called as the high pass filter. And you can design a particular filter that would let slowly varying part go. That is called as the low pass filter. And we will talk about uh, the, the transfer function and its application. And this tau r actually indicates the response time or it actually effectively determines the filter specifications. Uh, what is the bandwidth? What is the low pass free? What is the high pass frequency and so on. In significant detail in next class. But the idea is somehow we will be sequentially closing the loops to the point that all the loops are converted to a unity gain and the aircraft is controlled. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and answer any questions